worship the Lord tonight. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God.
Go ahead, just enter in for a minute. He takes us from glory to glory. Hallelujah. Go ahead, enter in. Enter in tonight from glory to glory to glory. Takes us higher and higher and higher. somebody on the shoulder and say, we're going to get a word tonight. And I can't wait to hear it. And while you're doing that, would you please give a round of applause and welcome Pastor Paul Chase.
glad you're here tonight. Tell somebody around you, say, it's a good thing you're here. Go ahead, look at them and say, we need this. Change is not accidental, it's intentional. And I think sometimes we've wasted too many times in services and went home and we could have really got something that we needed and we just missed it. We're not going to miss it tonight. Amen. Now, you may go to a mall and like to walk through the mall and look at stuff. I'm not much into window shopping. I like spending money. Can I get an amen? amen? Window shopping frustrates me. When you just look at what you can't get. After a while, it's like, why am I tormenting myself? Now, I have to admit, I do go online, and I'm looking at the 2019 Harleys, and I'm looking and praying and dreaming, and that's okay. But have you ever gone into a grocery store and walked around for an hour and a half and just looked at food and walked out with nothing? No? You don't usually shop in a grocery store, I mean window shop in a grocery store. Have you ever gone to a restaurant, sat in there for an hour and a half, looked at the menu, and then walked out and never ate anything? Wouldn't that be a waste of time? Wouldn't it be a waste of time to come to church service and go home with nothing? I want to encourage you, intentionally grab a hold of something tonight and take it home with you. My greatest desire is to help Pastor Steve and Amy. Really, that's that's why I'm here, to help them and to help you. Um, And I, I, I really pray that tonight you get a hold of something because if there's areas of your life where you're frustrated and and you want to see change and you haven't seen change and you don't know why, I think we'll get some answers tonight. So the change that's needed and necessary that you want and desire, you're going to begin to see. Because some of you are just really, really close to seeing some things break through. And I'm praying that what you get a hold of tonight, I'm praying that God reaches into your heads and your hearts and just makes a little adjustment and change begins to manifest. Are you ready for that? Father, we thank you for our time together tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. And as the two of those work in our lives, renewing our minds and and bringing in encouragement, bringing wisdom and, and understanding and spiritual perception, so things in us and for us and through us can be in line with your will and your plan and your purpose. And so we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I shared with you this morning that that I'm going to talk about seed. And uh, Pastor Steve said that he's been talking about seed. And so I I did a series, uh, gosh, last year, maybe two years ago. And it went for about seven or eight weeks on seed. And... uh, I was in a, in a seminar last year and taught some of what I'm going to share with you tonight. And somebody came up to me uh, from a publishing company and said, as soon as you write that book, we'll take it, we'll, we'll publish it, and we'll sell it for you. So I'm in the process of putting a book together on this. And I believe it will help you because there's nothing worse than, than wasting our time in church. Amen. Amen. Uh, in northern, the northern part of Norway, there is a vault. It's built into a mountain. Yeah, I think it's called Svarsvald. Svarsvald. It, anyway, it's Norwegian. It's hard to pronounce. And it is called a doomsday vault. And, uh, you know, I encourage you, uh, those of you who like to go on the Internet and Google or whatever or YouTube or whatever, you just Google it. Not now, but when you get home. And look at this vault. It's a doomsday vault, and, and it has something in there, deposits from every just about every single nation in the world, and the deposits made in that nation are there to make sure that after any kind of catastrophe or doomsday event 
earthquakes, typhoons, uh, volcanoes, or war, or whatever, would the worst case scenario that there are deposits in this vault to help rebuild and secure a future for that nation. And you're thinking, okay, what kind of deposits do they have in this vault? And only recently has there been a withdrawal from the vault in the first time in many, 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 many years. Even nations like North Korea have deposits in this vault because Norway is pretty neutral. So nations from all over the world, they have deposits to guarantee that there's always going to be a future. No matter how bad uh, the situation is right now, what's in that vault guarantees the future can 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 come. The, the present situation can change. What's deposited in the vault? Only one kind of thing. Seeds. It's a seed vault. Not gold, not silver, not food, not weapons, not intellectual uh, information. Seeds. For the first time, Syria has made a withdrawal from the vault because their nation is practically destroyed from civil war. At seed, in the beginning, one of the things we need to understand, it is a, a, a foundational and it's, it's a principle of creation. Now, I know Pastor Steve's been teaching on seed, and, and unfortunately, a lot of times, and especially when you, when you when turn on the television, and, and a lot of times I turn on the TV and, and, and I see certain, and, and I, I don't want to bang on preachers, but if the only time you talk about seed is you talk about money, then you're missing it. And, and it's like people can't talk about seed without talking uh, about money. Well, that's really not the greatest priority when it comes to seed, is money. Now, uh, I forget the brother's name who was receiving the offering this morning. What was his name? JT. You know, when he said that, you know, and of course I believe, I believe in tithing, I teach on tithing. And, uh, you know, tithing's not about law. Tithing was way before the law. Tithing's about honoring God. I mean, why do you think that Cain and Abel were bringing a tithe unto the Lord? Because their daddy taught them. Who was that? That was the first man. His name was Adam. He taught his boys, we're going to honor God with what we have, and we're going to bring our best. God didn't reject Cain's offering because it was fruits and vegetables. He rejected it because it wasn't his best, and it wasn't his first. I mean, uh, Abel, you know, he raised animals. Well, Cain was a tiller of the ground. Well, it's okay if you bring corn and vegetables and fruit, whatever. Just bring your first fruits. Bring your best. Don't bring your leftovers. God didn't reject it because it was apples or peaches or pears or apricots. He rejected it because it wasn't his first and it wasn't in his best. See, when it's not your first and it's not your best, there's no honor in it. Tithing is just about honoring God and trusting God. And what JT was saying, said, you know that, uh, and the scripture in Malachi says that I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that you cannot contain it. Well, you know, I, I begin to look at that, and when it says you cannot contain it, it doesn't mean, it doesn't, when it says there's not enough room to receive it, it's not talking about space. I mean, Jeff Bezos is now the richest man in the world. He's worth over a hundred billion, he passed Bill Gates. He's worth over $100 billion. How many know he has room for more? And I don't know what, what's in your account, but I'm sure there's room for more. Anybody here a billionaire? No. You a billionaire? Man. God, your dad, if that's your daddy, he ought to be a happy man. I don't know what you did with this young man, but teach the other one next to you so you can have two now. Come on, hook up with the other young brother there. So if you got one billion, do you have room for two billion? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what's in your account, but you got room for another million or a million? You can make room. You could go open up another account. There's enough banks in Florence to have a couple, have a million here and a million there. Bezos has room for over a hundred billion. Bill Gates, I don't know, he's seventy-five billion. If he makes some more money, he's got room for more. So it doesn't mean there's not enough room and there's not enough banks. It means your life isn't long enough to handle all he's going to bring into your life. That There's more money than you have years. There's more blessing than you have days. 
When it says you don't have enough room to contain it, it doesn't mean your storehouses just aren't big enough. Some of you maybe don't have storehouses big enough. But when it says blessed coming in and blessed going out, that means you've gone out and you still left so much blessing behind you because you didn't have enough life to spend it all. That's why the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Right. Because you're so blessed, you didn't use it all up. You left it for your kids and your grandkids, especially your grandkids because they're the best. I got grandkids now and I found out they're more fun than kids are. Because you can spoil them and give them back to mom and dad. Come on, somebody say amen. So understand, when God wants to bless you, it doesn't mean you just there's not enough banks. No, you can find more banks. just means you don't have enough years. You can finish your days blessed. And that all begins by sowing and giving. Of course, we teach a lot of principles on that, and I'm going to try to get into that. But I believe that God is wanting to do something wonderful in you that's ever-increasing. It's in you, it's for you, and it's with you. Say, in me. me. Say, for me. me. And with me. me. Now, let's go into the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis is the book of beginnings. And there are things that we learn in Genesis, principles, laws, the law of creation, There are things in Genesis that God ordains that just are not going to change. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and fruit, and, and, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. This is one of the most Incredible verses right here in the Bible. This is the law of creation. Old Testament, New Testament is not going to change. It doesn't matter Old, New, Old Testament going to New Testament. It doesn't change this. This is the law of creation. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. How many of you know you open up an apple, what are you going to find? Seeds. What is a seed? Guarantee of a future. Now, how many seeds in a peach? Oh, come on. That's not a hard question. Uh, you have uh, avocados here in South Carolina? Yeah? No? Okay. How many seeds in an avocado? Okay, one. Okay. How many avocados, how many avocados in a seed? Well, I don't know. See, anybody can count the seeds in a peach, but God can count the peaches in a seed. Now, let's go to something. How many times did God create? Do you realize that when you eat an avocado or a peach today, or what, what's, the, what's your favorite fruit here in South Carolina? Peaches. Y'all don't know? Come on, y'all live here. I don't. Can we just make it easy on me? Peaches, okay? You like peaches? All right. How many, did God, how many times did God create peaches? One time. Do you realize that peach you're eating today came from the first tree? God, when God created peaches, he didn't create it again. He put in, when, when the first tree came up, what did he put on the tree? Fruit. What did he put in the fruit? seeds what is a seed guarantee that there's a future see the seed is guarantee it's a promise that there's going to be more that's why you don't want to be a seedless grape you might like to eat them just don't be one you may like to eat seedless watermelon because you don't have to spit out the seeds but without seeds there's no next generation Seeds are the guarantee. There's how many, well, let's just make it easy. How many times did God create man? Let's look around the room. How many people on the earth today? Billions. But how many did God make? How many women did he make? How many women on the earth today? Well, see, everything that he created, what did he put in it? Go back to the law of creation. See, it's a law of creation. Everything has seed. No seed, no future. 
Without seed, you don't have a future. Your future is determined, well, that's why God wants you to bear fruit. Because where's the seed? It's in the fruit. No fruit, no seed. And it says, and, the, and, the, and it bore fruit according to its kind, and it was so. See, apples have apple seeds, and apple seeds will only grow apples. They will not grow oranges. Avocado seed will grow avocados. It will not grow carrots. Whether it's, whether it's plants, whether it's fruits, whether it's vegetables, or animals. Now, you can crossbreed. You know, you can crossbreed a, a horse and, and a donkey and get a mule. Amen. You can crossbreed different kind of dogs. My, my daughter, she has a dog. Uh, she has two dogs. One's a cross between a pit bull and a Labrador. Okay, not too bad. But the other dog, whoever made this dog, had to be high. <laughs> no, seriously. They had to be high, and somebody should slap that person. It is a crossbreed between a pit bull and a chihuahua. Now, do you agree they were high? Why would you do something like that? Really? Now, my nephew has a crossbreed between uh, a, a weenie dog and a chihuahua. They're called a chihuini. <laughs> you know, I, I feel bad for weenie dogs. It's like, I mean, the Germans made them. I think, why did you do that to this poor dog? You give him this body and the dude's got no legs. <laughs> and the fatter they get when they run along, their belly's just kind of bumping on the ground. So you can crossbreed dogs, but you can't crossbreed a dog and a cat and get a dat. <laughs> you, you can crossbreed horses, but you can't crossbreed a horse and a cow and get a how. You can't do it. They crossbreed all kinds of uh, different cows to, to make super breeds of cows for beef and whatever. They crossbreed all kinds of horses, but you cannot crossbreed a horse and a cow. You can crossbreed different kind of cats. If, if you go on the internet, you'll see an animal called a liger. It's, it's, it's a combination of a, of a lion and a tiger. It's huge. But you can't crossbreed a lion and a wolf. One's a cat. One's from the dog family. So you see, seed will reproduce after its own kind. And God put a limitation because he knows man. And I can guarantee you, over the years, nutcase scientists have tried to crossbreed the seed of humans with some kind of other animals or whatever. It will not work. All they got to do is go to Genesis and realize that no matter what they do, they are wasting their time. God put a limitation that seed only reproduces after its own kind. It will not work. You can't force it. You can't make it. It will not work. It's the law of creation. So instead of it working against you, why don't we let it work for us? And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, one of the things I want to show you also is the value of seed. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the very first time that the coming Messiah is ever referred to, he's referred to as seed. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and, between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The very first mention of the Christ, of the anointed one, of Jesus, the coming Messiah in Genesis, the very first mention that God has an answer to the new condition of mankind, which is sin, the very first answer that he communicates, he calls it seed. Because remember, seed reproduces after its own kind. 
And then when we go into Genesis chapter 4, and I want to try to get through this. Uh, I'm just still in my introduction, trying to get to my message here. Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. You know, Adam, I mean, Cain and Abel come together, and, and Cain kills his brother, kills Abel. In verse 25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. And look at, look at what uh, Adam says about him. For God has appointed another seed for me, Instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. What did he call his next son? He called him seed. Why? Because seed reproduces after its own kind. It looks just like you. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And then men began to call him the name of the Lord. And then in chapter 5, verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years, and begot a son in his own likeness after his own image. He begot a son after his own likeness and his own image, and he named him Seth. His own likeness and his own image. Why? Because seed reproduces after its own kind. It looks like you. Sowing seed is intentional, it's directional, it's purposeful, and it's generational. One of the reasons that I'm here is, is because I, I love this couple and I wanted to spend time with them before I flo- flew out and to sow seeds into them, to make a deposit into their life to make a difference in this church. I look at Steve and Amy like, like a nephew. Now he calls me Uncle Paul, but, but I have 120 sons. No, I'm not Father Abraham, but I, I, have, a, I have a lot of sons. I have natural sons, too, but then I have spiritual sons. And, and, and I sow into their lives, and the more I sow into their lives, they begin to look like me. In fact, well, not in the natural because most of them are all Filipinos. Well, I've got Filipino sons, I've got Indian sons, Malaysian sons, uh, Burmese sons, Nepali sons, Vietnamese sons. I got sons from all over. That doesn't mean I'm sleeping around. They're spiritual sons, okay? <laughs> you know, sometimes you've got to qualify things, especially with cameras on. Spiritual sons, not sin, just spiritual sons. Now, God makes a covenant with Abraham in Genesis because he's going to bring forth something into the, into the earth. You can break any cycle by sowing seed. And I believe very likely the number one problem for believers is they want what seed can get them and not what seed can make them. That's why we need to back up a little bit. If we only talk about what seed can get me and not what it can make me, you have missed the greatest priority of what seed is supposed to do. Seed is not supposed to just bring something to you. Seed is supposed to do something in you first. Amen. You've heard the answer, sow seed and let it, let it grow the change you need. Yeah, I believe that 100%. But it starts here. Not out there. Because otherwise it's, God, I, I, you know, I, I want you to honor your word of what you can do for me, but I'm not so interested in you honoring your word of what you want to do in me. Because God is more concerned about the kind of person you become than the kind of things you accomplish or what you get. And this is where I believe we need to bring the pendulum back. Because if you look in the New Testament, one of the only things that it says that you were predestined It says you were predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. Now, can you imagine we get to heaven, which I I plan on getting there. Anybody else going to heaven? And we get there, and, and the only thing God is concerned about is not what you did, not what you accomplished, but how much you became like his son. Yeah, but you know, Lord, I was doing this for you, and Lord, I did this for you, and I gave this, and I gave this. Yeah, 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 that's all good, but tell me, how much did you become like my son? Because my greatest desire for you as a person was not your performance and not what you did and, and not the recognition you tried to gain and how many people knew you, but my greatest joy was seeing the character and the personality of my son just... In you, because I really didn't care about what you did here, 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 and there. Just how much were you like 
him. See, that's not usually a priority of becoming like him. It's getting him something to do something for us. Sometimes preachers, we're the worst about that. Because we can get so busy working for him that we forget about our greatest responsibility is to be like him. Because if Jesus is the word made flesh and he's the seed and I allow that word to be deposited in my life, then seed reproduces after its own kind. So the more of the word and the more of the seed I get, the more I should become like him. Which is one of the major reasons why the devil tries to steal the word because he doesn't want the word, the seed, to reproduce because if seed reproduces after its own kind, it re reproduces the person, the image, the character of Jesus in you. How does the kingdom of heaven work? Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, the kingdom of heaven works like this. Mark chapter 4. Let's go there real quick. Mark 4, 26. i got to speed this up. The kingdom of heaven is as if a man would scatter seed on the ground. He said, listen, this is how the kingdom works. You want to know how the kingdom works? It works by sowing seed. As if a man would scatter seed on the ground, and he should sleep by, and sleep by night, rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, and he himself does not know how. Aren't you glad you don't have to know how it works? You just believe it does. I don't have to explain it. I just know it works. And you sow the seed. For the earth yields crops itself, first the blade, then the head, and then after that the full grain in the head. In other words, this is how the kingdom works. There's a sowing, and then it grows. First the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. It's smaller, and when seed grows, it becomes bigger. And this is where you have to be very, very careful. You don't judge things by the outside. Because an avocado seed is big. It's a little bit smaller than a tennis ball. But a mustard seed is real little. But a, a full-grown mustard tree is two to three times bigger than an avocado tree. So how can this huge tree, if you put a mustard seed in your pocket, you would lose it in the lint? Yeah, if you put a mustard seed in there, then you try to find it between the creases in your pocket, you'd go... Oh man, I lost it. I can't, I can't even. You put an avocado seed in your pocket? You ain't gonna lose it. You put a peach seed in there? It's there. But a, a mustard seed, it's like, oh man, it's gone. But you know what's inside that seed? A tree. A tree. God put a tree in a seed. But that tree never comes out till it's planted. See, that's why you can't judge the person sitting next to you. You might look at them and go, man, what's up with that person? Look at her. Look at him. He looks kind of goofy. He's kind of messed up. He ain't worshiping. You have no, don't judge what's inside that person by what they look like on the outside. They might look like a mustard seed, but you have no idea what God squeezed down and put on the inside of them. And he's just waiting until they get into a good church and get planted, and they're getting ready to bust out and come forth. You don't even know what's inside you, much less what's inside the person next to you. You ought to tell the person, be nice to me. You don't know who you're sitting next to. Yeah. Yeah. I look at the person next to you and say, if you knew who you were sitting next to, you'd take me out for dinner right after this service. <laughs> Three things God does for you in any season of your life. This is really what I want to get to. That was just all introduction. Hang in there. Doors are locked. You can't get out. It's all right. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, that have heard me for the first time, I've done things in this church I haven't done in other places. because of our relationship. You remember the Sunday I came, I kicked everybody out of church? How many of y'all were here? Yeah. yeah. One Sunday I said, okay, everybody, just don't leave, just go outside. Kicked everybody out of church. 
Go outside, and before you come in, you pray for this service. Oh, 15, 30 seconds. Lord, I thank you that when we come into service today, this, the word of the Lord is in the heart and upon the lips of my pastor. I thank you for the anointing of God upon every musician, upon every singer, and every person that comes into the service today. Lord, they come in hurt, wounded, broken, sad, mad, disappointed, frustrated, got into an argument on the way to church, which that happens. Come on, I'm a pastor. It happens to me. People that are coming into church that need healing, people coming into church that are not saved, they told their, some husband is coming with his wife today. He said, all right, I'll go one time. If you stop nagging me, he's here one time today. Jesus, you better get him. He's only coming once. <laughs> you have no idea. First time visitors, you have no idea the condition, the hurt, the tragedy that's happened. Jesus, show up, give somebody a word, touch their life, let the presence of God touch their hearts. We need to meet with you today. That took a minute. And if everybody prayed over the service, boy, the different kind of service you would have instead of coming in to see the Pastor Steve show on Sunday morning. So that's what I did. I kicked everybody out and said, go outside, pray, then come back in. We're not going to do that tonight. All right, number one. The value of seeds. Number one, seeds are sown in us. When God wants to do something great in you, he sows seeds in your heart. Everything begins by what he's sowing in you. How did you get saved? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, the word of God, which lives and abides forever. You heard words. You heard words, you believed it in your heart, you said a prayer, you believed that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, and what happened? You got saved. In a moment, in an instant of time, you were delivered out of darkness into light, out of death into life. Amen. How long does it take to get saved? About that quick. A miracle happened. How did Mary get pregnant? She had a conversation with an angel. That only happened once. Don't try to tell your daddy. I was just talking to an angel. No, that don't work no more. <laughs> she had a conversation with an angel, and when she said, be it unto me according to your word, just like that, she conceived. What is the power of God's word when it comes alive in your life? It conceives and it gives birth to life. Eternity is born on the inside of you. You are recreated in Christ Jesus. How quick? That quick. Why? Because of a seed that was planted. So everything begins in your life with what's planted in you. Now Mark chapter 14, which is the parable of the sower. Jesus gives him the parable of the sower. He says, look, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed some seed that some fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up, and because it had no depth of earth, when the sun was up, it was scorched, it withered away, had no fruit. Some fell, some fell among the thorns, the thorns grew up and choked it, it yielded no crop. So we have seed going out, some falls on the wayside, the birds come, they eat it immediately, bears no fruit. Say no fruit. No fruit. So you sow seed with a lack of direction, and it doesn't go and it doesn't hit the ground. And the birds come immediately. Say immediately. immediately. What do they do? They eat the seed. So does the seed produce? No. So the seed has no fruit. Say no fruit. No fruit. Then some seed falls on, st on uh, stony ground. It's hard. It goes into the ground. And it says they, they receive it with gladness. But then when the sun comes out, when the heat comes, it grows up quick. But when... The heat comes because it has no depth of earth. Why does it have no depth? Well, because the ground is hard. So it can't get roots down to get established. So it just lasts a little while, and it falls over. And the Bible says, no fruit. Say no fruit. No fruit. So that's two kinds. No fruit. It bears no fruit. Seed producing nothing. The third one goes in thorny ground. So the seed gets into the ground, but it's surrounded by, by, by weeds, and, and so the, the, the plant grows up. But the weeds are also there, and it says that they choke it, and it bears no fruit. Say no fruit. no fruit. 
So we have three times, three, three areas where the seed goes, and what does it bear? Come on, one more time. What does it bear? What does it bear? How many Christians are bearing? But he says, well, some seed falls on good ground, and he yields 30, 60, and 100 fold return. Well, of course, the disciples, when they get along with Jesus, they go, you know, Lord, uh, okay, seed, ground, birds, stone, thorns, uh, we don't get it. What are you talking about? So he explains it. He said, the sower sows the word. Everybody say the word. The word. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you are spirit and life. Jesus said, my, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word by no means will pass away. So is the word good? Yes. So one of the things that we're seeing about the parable of the sower is that if the seed is the word, the seed is at the mercy of the condition of the soil. Oh, come on. If you don't get this, you're going to miss the whole night here. The seed is at the mercy of the soil. Wayside, what did it bear? Stony ground. Thorny ground. And then he says, okay, now the sower sows the word. Is the word good? Yeah, but when it fell on the wayside, it says... The devil comes, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word. Why? Because seed reproduces after its own kind. Why does he come to take the word? Because the last thing he wants is that word to be reproduced in you. It's not, see, not for you, in you first. He doesn't want it rooted in your heart. Bottom line of the parable of the sower. If seed doesn't find its way into your heart, it reproduces nothing in your life. Now some of you are going to get some answers why you're not seeing change yet. Because this brother has been sowing good seed. And if you're more concerned about where you're going to eat afterwards, or you look act like you're taking notes on your iPhone, but you're playing some game or texting some chick in the back row, that word is falling on the wayside and, and that seed that you received in the service that day was meant to be planted in your heart because the harvest of that planting was the answer you needed in your life. But since the seed got stolen and you see everybody's looking for an immediate answer but the kingdom of heaven is growing things in you not just dropping things on you. Amen. Amen. The children of Israel came into the promised land the days of miracles of quail and manna ceased they then began to eat from the fruit of the land of what grew and as believers we need to get to the place where we understand that the answers that I'm going to need in my life God's going to grow it in me Whew. I'm really trying to get done here Pastor Steve I'm, I'm okay So it falls on wayside, the devil comes immediately. Why? He doesn't want it reproduced. He knows if this stuff grows in you, he's in trouble. So then some falls on, on stony ground. What is stony ground? That's where there's hardness, where you haven't dug up some things. That's hurts, pains, offenses, unforgiveness. How many of you right now, if I was to mention a certain name of somebody in your life, you'd almost want to cuss? Or is there anybody in your life right now, if you could get maybe a 15-second timeout from God, you would just love to slap the fire out of somebody? Oh, come on. You might as well be honest. How many of you think that the laying on of hands would knock some sense into somebody? And you, love, you would love to volunteer? Yeah. How many of you have some hurts, some pains, some wounds? See, hardness is unresolved issues from the past. And if you don't deal with that, then seed doesn't find depth of earth. Because what you hear doesn't need to go shallow into your head. It needs to go deep into your heart. So we don't need the hardness of what's going on here in our thoughts and our emotions to stop the depth of what needs to get planted here. And the Bible says in Proverbs, the preparation of the heart belongs to man, not God. See, God is responsible for the seed. Is the seed good? 
But the seed is at the mercy of the soil. Who's responsible for the soil? We are. What's the soil? It's our heart. That's why the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence. In other words, you take care of your heart so when the seed comes, the seed comes into good ground. Why? Because the seed is good, but the seed is at the mercy of the soil. So if I make sure that the offenses or the hurts, the pains of the things that really frustrated me, Lord, I, I choose to forgive them. I'm going to release that. I'm going to let that go. I, I got to go on. I cannot afford to allow any kind of hardness in my heart because what happens is it stops the reproduction of this seed that guarantees my future. You can hear all the offerings you want about what will come to you. Boy, you better get ready for what needs to grow in you before it can just come to you. Because if you don't get this right, what comes to you, you won't use right anyway. The most important thing is what happens in your heart. You get this right, let me tell you, money will no longer be the issue. Because for some people, money's not their problem. It's a heart issue. It's not a money problem. It's a heart problem. So seeds sown in us, past hurts, wounds, unresolved issues. And then you get the thorny ground, disappointment. Thorny ground, that's something that's weak. That's something that's growing now. There are conflicts, and, and, and when Jesus explains it, he says the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things, the cares of this world, worries and fears. That's why the re one of the reasons we come in and we worship is not just because, well, you know, we just sing first, then we have the word. No, we come in and we worship so we get our minds off of ourselves and we get our mind on him. We begin to declare about his goodness and his greatness. And we take our fears and our worries and our concerns and we cast it upon him. And we condition our hearts through worship and through praise so we get them right. So at that time of the service when the word has come forth, we've taken some time to prepare our hearts to receive what heaven wants to plant. Because otherwise, you go into the Word and you got your pastor throwing a bucket load of seed on you, but if you got weeds that have filled your heart, it will begin to grow. But the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. See, God's Word is not one desire among many. It should be the greatest desire above them all. And when I've got a heart that is so full of so many other things, I may have this passion trying to push itself up. I may have this purpose trying to push through the weeds, but it shouldn't have to fight through the weeds. I should be a tender of the garden of my heart to pull out the unnecessary so the purposes of God can freely grow. And this garden God has planted on the inside of me can bring forth and bring forth the fruit. And in that fruit, I got more seeds. You know, you take one peach seed and you plant it. What are you going to get? You're going to get a tree. What's on that tree? Peaches. How many peaches in a harvest? A thousand? You get a thousand peaches off a tree? What's in those thousand peaches? A thousand seeds. And you plant those seeds. What do you have? One thousand and one trees. Next harvest, how many peaches do you have? A million. You went from one to a million because you planted it, it bore fruit, and that fruit was guaranteed there's more. See, if something doesn't get planted, there's no multiplication to come. And it's not the multiplication that comes here. It's what comes here. It begins in you first. God's greatest desire, because if He can get it in you... Oh, you don't have to worry about him bringing it to you. You are the garden he wants to sow in first. In the beginning, God put man in the garden. After that, he put the garden in man. So what will you allow to be planted in you determines the kind of life that you will live. What you hear determines the health of your heart. So I Proverbs 4.20 says, Give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it flows the issues of life. What gets sown in us determines the character and the attitudes of our heart. It's not the emotional reaction from a soulish response or intellectual reasoning. It's a flow of life that comes out of your spirit because God's word has become rooted in your life. Roots determine fruits. 
teach a class called Roots of Character. You, you want to change the fruit on your tree? Deal with the roots. Too many times we're just trying to pick all the fruit off and say, okay, next season we're going to have better fruit. No, the fruit on the outside is determined by the root on the inside. The Bible says a good man, the good treasure of his heart brings forth. See, what's growing in you is going to come out. It's seed planted in your heart, not your head. What's alive in your heart is greater and helps you overcome and deal with the challenges that are in your head. It's a word in your, sown in your heart that renews the challenges of your mind. You cannot fix on the outside if you don't allow God to sow things on the inside by the seed that you receive that goes into good ground. Now, I'm going to try to hurry this up because we got two more parts. See, what God sows in you is the beginning. It's the most important part. Then we get to number two. See, when you understand the value of what God can grow in you, your future, your character, your personality, the kind of man you become, the kind of woman you become, the kind of father, the kind of husband, because of what's growing on the inside. What's growing on the inside determines what's going to come out on the outside. That's what God really cares about. And then when you understand the value of sowing, then God okay, says, okay, now look, what I'm growing in you determines the kind of person you become. Now, I'm going to teach you to be the sower. See, first you're the ground. Now you're the sower. So we learn how to sow seed. When God wants to do something great in us, he sows in us. When he wants to do something great for us, then he teaches us to sow seed. Seed is the source of beginning. It's the continuing of everything. It's the miraculous. It's the multiplication that guarantees the future. God puts the potential and the power and the promise of increase in your hand. He says, you want more? How many of you want more? Okay, you're not too excited about that. Okay, how many of you want more? God says, you want more? Fine, it's up to you. No, 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 God, it's up to you. No, 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 God says, it's up to you. You want more? I'm going to teach you. I'm going to put no limitation upon what you get. You can have as much as you want because I'm going to give you seed. And if you'll operate with the principle of understanding how seed works, there's no limitation to what comes to your life. So don't blame me. That's why the Bible says, God is, be not deceived, God is not mocked. In other words, don't be finger pointing, don't be blaming God. You blessed him, you blessed her, you didn't bless me. No, and God will say, they gave, they gave, you're cheap. <laughs> they obeyed, they obeyed, you, you're stubborn as a donkey. See, because we want to say, God, you bless them. God, you bless them. God, you bless them. Where's mine? God said, I gave you seed just like I gave them seed, just like I gave them seed. They sowed their seed. You ate yours. You ate your future. See, because if it's up to God, then we could blame him. But God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that shall he also Whatever a man sows. It doesn't say whatever God sows. What God sows is the word. The seed for your prosperity is not sown by God. It's sown by you. So he takes his principle that he first uses in you. Then he shows you how to use it and said, okay, your future, your prosperity, your blessing. Here you go, sweetheart. It's in your hands. Go for it. All right. I'm going to take this little seed and I'm going to plant. The Bible says he gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. Eat the bread, sow the seed. Yeah, but I like seeds. If you eat them, you just ate your future. Even Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your life. You know, you, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. It didn't say God will make your way prosperous. He says you are determining your future prosperity by your obedience to the word that you meditate on and do. If you'll meditate on it and if you'll do it, you have just determined your future prosperity and your success. Now, I'm going to teach you how to sow. I'm going to teach you how to be a giver. I'm going to teach you the value of tithing. And if you'll sow, if you'll give, if you give sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. But if you give abundantly, you will reap. 
So my what comes to me is not God's responsibility. He just multiplies what I sow. And you multiply zero by a million, you still get zero. He said, listen, I'll, I'll bless you. Being a giver is a lifestyle. It's not a one-time event. It's not in an envelope. It's not just on a Sunday morning. We're going to look for opportunities to be giver in everyday life. Amen. And it's not just money. It's obedience. It's prayer. It's words. It's how I sow. What gets sown in you is how you believe, and then it determines how you sow. Matthew 13, he put forth another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in the field, which is indeed the least of all the seeds. But when it's grown, it's greater than all the herbs and becomes a tree so the birds of the air come and rest in its branches. The least of the seeds becomes greater than all the other herbs. And it's not a bush. A mustard tree is not a bush. It's a tree. It's a huge tree. You sow diligence. You sow faithfulness. You reap faithfulness. Malachi, you bring your tithes into the storehouse. He said, come on. Like Pastor C was sharing this morning, or uh, JT was sharing, prove me. You want to test me out? You want to check me out? Go ahead. I dare you. Put me, you want to put me to the test? Come on. You don't scare me. Come on. Put me to the test. Bring your tithe in. Honor me. Watch what I'll do for you. I mean, there is no limitation of what can happen. Think about this. I I love to get my imagination in when I read the Bible. Remember when Jesus fed the multitude? And he said, you know, they said, the disciples said, Lord, send them away. They're hungry. He said, no, you feed them. Yeah, but, 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 you know, wait, you want us to spend this much money? I mean, there was 5,000 men there, says they fed that day. Now, if there was 5,000 men, how many women were there? Because we know there's usually more women in church. Come on, can I get an amen? How many kids were there? Because there was kids there too because they ripped off a little boy's lunch. Right? He says, so go and see what you have. So they come back with a little boy's lunch. Now, they didn't come back with some bluefin tuna. It was a little boy's lunch. Now, if you had five loaves and two fish, how big were those fish? Come on, it's a little boy's lunch. Like our billionaire over here. (laughs) How big were those fish? Maybe like this? Yeah? Yeah? So he's got two fish like this. Now you got at least 10,000 people. You got 12 disciples. I'm going to make the math real easy. You got 12 disciples, you got two fish. So you take each fish and you break it into six pieces, right? For those of you that are mathematically challenged, come on now. Two fish, 12 disciples. So each fish you break into six pieces. So you, So Jesus blesses it and he breaks it gives it to the disciples multiplication did not come when it really when it left jesus's hand he gives it to the disciples said okay go feed him can you imagine peter going up there and going man i got a head i got a piece of bread this big lord are you serious i got a head john's over here and he's going bro I got the tail. What are you complaining about? (laughs) Peter's got the head. John's got the tail. Maybe James maybe had the meaty part in the middle. But they got a piece of fish this big. And Jesus said, go on, feed them. (laughs) Really? Go on. And as they began to give it out, They fed over 10,000 people, and they collected 12 baskets. When does multiplication come? When it goes out. And it didn't multiply from his hands. It multiplied when it left theirs. See, multiplication doesn't come until seed gets planted. And he don't plant it. You do. So he grows it in you. Then he grows it for you. But just as much as you're responsible to take care of your heart so he can grow it in you, you're responsible now to be the sower so he can grow it and multiply it for you. If he multiplies it in you, he will certainly multiply it 
and bring it back to you. Okay, we got one more. I, I'm really cutting this short. Uh, next time I come, I'll bring the book. In Jesus' name. I don't really like writing books. They're a lot of work. I like talking, and, but I don't like writing books. Number three. Well, first of all, he sows in us. And, and I'm not going to go through. There's so many verses about God multiplying what we sow. I, your pastor has covered that. We'll continue to cover that in amazing ways. But then I want to get to the last one. We can close. So he sows in us, number one. He multiplies what we sow. And then, if God wants to do something great in you, he sows in you. When he wants to do great, something great for you, he multiplies what you sow. Then when he wants to do something great with you, he sows you. See, you're the ground, you're the sower, but then you actually become a seed. When God wants to do something great through you, he sows you in a place. Seed sown in us, we're the soil. We sow seed, we're the sower. And then we are the good seed, and we become the seed that gets sown. What gets sown in us determines how we sow and if we will allow God to sow us. Matthew 13. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Say good seed. Good seed. Come on, everybody say good seed. So good seed in the field. While the men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Tares look like wheat, but they have no grain in it. It's just fake, phony, and no fruit. See, if there's no fruit, there's no seed. No seed, no future. It's pretentious. I'm so glad there's no plastic plants up here. Plastic looks good. You dust it off, but it never grows and never multiplies. You don't want to be some plastic or some silk plant that you come into church, we dust you off, but you never grow and you never multiply. You want to be real. And if you're real, you go through changes. If you're real, you get pruned. If you're real, you grow, you change, you bear fruit. Plastic don't bear fruit. We don't need plastic and silk Christians that we dust off every Sunday and you just look good, but you never change. <laughs> Tell the person next to you, I ain't silk. I like it, but I'm not. So Jesus... Uh, explains that they come back and they go, Lord, okay, we don't we don't understand the parable of the sower either. And so in verse thirty-seven, verse thirty-six. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, went into the temple, into the house. The disciples came to him, saying, "Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field." And he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. You say, you see, when he's sowing in you, he's sowing good seeds into the ground. He's sowing in you. And then you're sowing seed. But now it says, He who sows the good seeds is the Son of Man. And the good seeds, say good seeds, are the sons of the kingdom. See, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. Are you a son or a daughter of the kingdom? Come on. Are you the son or daughter of the kingdom? Yes. See, so if it gets sown in you, it gets sown by you, then you get to the place where he wants to sow you. Because when he wants to bring change to, when he wanted to bring change to Florence, he sowed a Steve and Amy seed. When he wanted to bring change to the Philippines, he sowed a Paul and Shadi seed. And what happens is when you sow a seed, you grow a tree, and that tree bears fruit. What's the beauty of fruit? Fruit has seeds, and from those seeds comes more trees. And so there's a future. There's a multiplication that comes because some good seed got planted. There are things on the inside of us that you have never imagined, and they will never come forth until you get planted. There is a tree on the inside of you waiting to just break out. So don't look at yourself, misjudge yourself as small, insignificant, because you're not some big, impressive avocado seed. You might look, listen, David, when Samuel came 
to anoint the next king of Israel. He was told to go to Jesse's house. He comes in and tells the father, I'm here to anoint the next king of Israel. And Eliab comes out. He's tall, big, good looking. He says, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. God says, no, it's not him. But come on, look at this boy. Let me come on. Lord. He says, no, you look as man looks. You all look at outward appearance, but I, the Lord, I look at the heart. Next son, not him. Next son, not him. Next son, not Seven sons. Nope, 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 nope. It finally goes, is this it? Is this all there is? You got no more sons? Because he knew where God told him to go. And they go, oh, yeah, David. But oh, come on, David. I mean, he's the, he's the youngest. He's kind of skinny, scrawny, smells like sheep. I mean, surely, I mean, come on, Dave, really, David? They didn't even think. They're all lined up. Nobody thought, hey, somebody needs to call for David. Why? <laughs> it's obviously not going to be him. His daddy didn't think about him. His brothers certainly didn't think about him. David come walking in, and God goes, he's the one. Sometimes it's the most unlikely. Jerusalem is called the city of David. Jesus is called the son of David. And he wasn't even considered or recognized by his daddy or his brothers. You don't allow the lack of recognition from man to cut you out of what God has for you. You may not be the biggest looking seed, but God can squeeze some beautiful things inside of little tiny insignificant things. And all you got to do is get planted. Because if you don't get planted, that potential will never come out. It'll stay locked up. You won't have it grow in you. You won't have it grow for you. And you won't have it grow because of you. We have minimized what's coming to us and what we hear. We have minimized what is done through us for our giving. And we have minimized who we are and what we have and where we are because we judge ourselves after the flesh. Don't judge my shell. You have no idea what God put on the inside of me. And don't be in a hurry. Trees take time to grow. Right now, you may feel like you're covered up in dirt. Hang in there. You're putting down roots. You may just be a little nut covered up with some dirt. But honey, your best days are ahead of you. You have magnificent, beautiful days where you break forth into the sunlight. You allow that sun and that rain and the roots to go down. Stop comparing yourself with who's around you and be focused on what God has for your life. Get planted, get secure, get stable. Let God plant you. Because if he's planting a good seed... He knows where he wants to plant it. God doesn't plant good seeds in bad ground. He designed the seed, what it, would, what it would produce, so quit comparing yourself with somebody else. God made you, and you, you need to be happy with that. God has prepared you as a seed, and he wants to sow you, plant you in the ground where he has prepared. And the first place you need to be planted is in a local church. You don't want to be potted because you can just pick up your little pot and go somewhere else. <laughs> and we don't want bonsai. You ever seen bonsai plants? They're cute, they're pretty, and they're irritating. Why? Because you always, they take so much attention. We don't want no bonsai Christians that every time they come in, pastor's got to give them so much attention. You got to clip a little here and clip a little there and squirt a little water here and squirt a little water there. And they're root bound in their pot. They're never going to go big. They're never going to go white. And they will never bear fruit. And they will never reproduce. But boy, do they take a lot of attention. Somebody needs to come in, jerk that little sucker right out of the pot, stick it in the ground, say, grow, baby, grow. If you're a potted Christian, you can just pick up your pot and go somewhere else. <laughs> set down your pot. You don't like it there? You pick up your pot. I pray the Holy Ghost gets a hammer, breaks your pot. You get roots down. Something bothers you, and you go to say, you know what? I'm going to... Oh, wait a minute. Because <laughs> you get rooted in, and your roots are growing. You may get rooted next to the person irritating you. 
And God is saying, stay, grow, mature, overcome it, deal with it, learn, grow, love, show some mercy. Yeah, but they irritate me. Yeah, but you irritate them too. Come on, let me grow something in you. Quit running from it. You run from the challenge and you want to go somewhere else. Oh, I pray if you're potted, God bust your pot tonight. You begin to put down roots, and they begin to go deep, and when they go down deep, they go wide. Let me tell you, you take a little goldfish, put him in a little bowl, he'll stay small. But when he gets into a bigger place, he can grow and increase. You will never grow and increase till you get planted. Let God plant you. Psalms 92, verse 12, the righteous will flourish like a date. I love this in the Amplified. Long-lived, upright, and useful. They will grow like cedar in Lebanon, majestic and stable, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. Growing in grace, they will strive, thrive, and bear fruit and prosper, even in old age. I'm not, I'm not old. I'm just older. So my staff, don't call me old. Make sure you put the er on there. They will bear fruit and prosper in old age. They will be flourish. They will flourish. Be vital and fresh, rich in trust, love and contentment. Boy, that's me. They are living memorials to declare that the Lord is upright and faithful to his promise. He is my rock and there's no unrighteousness in him. You will bear fruit in every season. There's evidence of continued life because fruit carries seed. Seed sown in me is my progress and my maturity. Seed sown by me is my prosperity and my multiplication. Me sown as a seed is where I find purpose. Who I am, what I will have, and what I can do is seed. When God wants to bring change in a life, to a life, and to a place, he plants seed. You're the ground, you're the sower, you're the seed. And I'll just let Pastor Steve continue on this and however he wants to take it. Just help anybody. Come on, let him grow it in you. Let him multiply it to you. You say, okay, God, you can plant me. Do you trust God to plant you? Come on, everybody stand up. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord, they'll flourish. The Bible says when you meditate on the Lord, you're like a tree. What? That's planted. Get planted. Your leaf will not wither. You bear fruit in due season. And whatever you do, it'll prosper. It'll succeed. Why? You plant it. He's growing it in me. He's multiplying it back to me. And then he takes my life and he says, let me show you. Let me show you some purpose. Let me use you to affect eternity. Don't think it's just people like me who go to the nations of the world that you say, oh, man, I, I wish I had a purpose like yours. No, you don't. You just need your purpose, not mine, because I can't walk out your purpose. I don't have the grace for your life. You don't have the grace for my life. And you are just as graced and just as valuable and just as precious in the eyes of God to do whatever it is that God wants you to do Never compare yourself to anybody else and thinking, oh man, they're really doing something for God. Without the grace of God, I couldn't do it. I am what I am by the grace of God. You are what you are by the grace of God. When you let him plant you, there's a purpose that comes alive. And then there's a passion that comes alive because you know you're a good seed. God has put you somewhere and you want your life to count. You'll be planted in this house. You'll be planted in the house of the Lord. You grow in this community of believers. You touch your city. Let them grow it in you. Let them multiply it back to you. And then let them show you. And your life will be one glorious adventure. And I will see you next year. Great. You know, I'm going to... I don't know. If, I, I know it's okay. He'll he'll do what I ask him to do because I I know he understands what I understand and that 
I believe we want to bless your life. First, I want to do something. If everybody would just sit down. Obviously, the very first thing we need to do is, is bless the man of God. I said it this morning. We shouldn't. The word says don't muzzle. The ox means it feed. Feed what feeds you. Feed what feeds you. If you, you know, somebody's pouring word into you, and here's what I believe we're going to do. I'm going to leave the altars open, and Pastor Paul and I are going to lay hands on people tonight. There might be people in this room that need healing, that need deliverance, that need change, that need something. And, and after the offering is over, I'm going to invite you to come, and we're going to come up here and lay hands on you. Primarily, it's going to be Pastor Paul, and I know he doesn't mind doing this. I, want, I believe in impartation. And when somebody lays hands on us, something is deposited in us. It's given to us. He said, by the laying on of hands in the Bible, he declared to us that we receive things. And I believe that the anointing that's in him can be received in us. And so I want to allow that tonight. And, and you don't have to stay. We're not going to ask everybody to stay. After the offering, I'm going to pray for you and, and dismiss. When I dismiss, then those of you that want to be uh, uh, prayed for, make your way up here. And please, just stand in the aisles. When this fills up up here, make room for others. And then as they leave, you come behind them. Would you do that? Ushers, if you would stand, let's take up an offering real quickly. Just play something a little more, a little more sedate, not as quite as uh, energized. You know, you are great. Father, we thank you for this offering right now. We thank you for it, and we give you praise, and we give you glory. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name. Take up the offering, ushers, if you would. Them up, and then we're going to pray for you. Amen. Go into that again, and then go into that other song. 